And you really weren't any less a driver. It's just that I cheated a little, aren't you? <laughs> we spent long days and nights getting ready to get MR3 ready to go. I was going to be the blockhouse communicator. And we were together on the communication system in the launch. And I'll never forget, there was not a dry eye anywhere in the blockhouse when we launched. And I had Werner Ron Brown and Kurt Debus right at my right elbow. And they were very excited to be able to speak to Al very briefly. And then you were my capsule communicator on my Mercury flight. Well, we had lots of, lots of good flying, lots of good times together, lots of good tests, and a lot of things going on. Now you're up there in that big hangar in the sky having a lot of good flights, and we'll miss you, Al. But we'll be there before long, so we'll try some of that flying ourselves. My best to all of you, and we'll miss Al. Thank you. Gordon Cooper, with a common line message from everyone here today. We'll miss you, Al. We'll be back in a moment. As a small to mid-sized business owner, you've got financial issues coming at you from all directions. It makes it difficult to focus your energy on the big ideas that will grow your business. At Merrill Lynch, our financial consultants are backed by business financial specialists to help you create a plan to help your business run smoothly today and prepare for tomorrow. With the Merrill Lynch Working Capital Management Account, big business doesn't have an advantage over small business anymore. Now your small business can get the kind of cash management big business gets and banks don't provide. Call Merrill Lynch today for our free software, WCMA Maximizer. Learn how our Working Capital Management Account can maximize your business's cash flow by integrating checking, borrowing, and investments. At Merrill Lynch, we have resources around the world to help our clients manage all aspects of their finances. Call 1-800-MERRILL-EXTENSION-7 today to get your free WCMA Maximizer software. The difference is Merrill Lynch. Congratulations. Your business is growing. Now who's going to do all the work? You need Management Recruiters International, your staffing partner. From teams of skilled salespeople to technical experts to a single key senior manager, MRI takes responsibility and finds the talent you need without missing a beat. After all, you're growing. Why stop now? MRI. Do I like to shop? Oh, yes. How you doing? Franks and beans? Aisle five. Beans and franks? Aisle seven. Hi. Hi. Fat free. Nothing but cut. Check this out. Shopper. Right now, use your card at supermarkets and get double membership rewards points. I love this card. This is Edgar Mitchell, who spent nine hours on the surface of the moon during Apollo 14 with Alan Shepard. I want to pay tribute to him and what a privilege it was to serve with Alan Shepard. And I'm sure that wherever it is that astronauts and explorers go when we depart this realm, that Alan and Sue, Deke and Gus, Roger, Ed, Elliot, Charlie, CC, Jack, Jim, and Ron, pioneering and exploring and doing things that one day we will all be doing together again. Farewell and thanks a lot.
Jim Lovell from Apollo 13. Louise, Shepard family, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I first met Al Shepard when he and I, and he and I were part of the original Mercury candidate group. Of course, I knew of him through his work he had done at the Naval Air Test Center. Al offered me a ride in his Corvette from the hotel to the Dolly Madison house where we were briefed by about Project Mercury. And I thought to myself, this is one naval officer who really has it made. How much does one of these cost, I asked him. And he replied, if you got to ask, you can't afford to own one. <laughs> but Al was a natural born leader, the type that people want to emulate and follow. And sure enough, it wasn't long before a lot of us were driving Corvettes. <laughs> Al's legacy as a pioneer in our space program is firmly etched in the history books. He was fiercely competitive and won the position to be the first American in space. He had the motivation and the perseverance to hang in there during eight years of being grounded before he finally flew on Apollo 14 and landed on the moon in a place called Frau Maro. When that opportunity was earlier denied me, I cannot think of a more appropriate person to take my place than Alan B. Shepard. Al's legacy in space is a thing of the past, a legacy future generations can reflect on when they want to remin reminisce about the early heroes of space exploration. But Al Shepard left another legacy, one that did not die with him, a legacy that is alive, growing, and prosperous. He was the driving force behind the establishment by the Mercury 7 astronauts of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. It started out modestly enough in 1986 with a distribution of $1,000 to seven aspiring future engineers and scientists. But just recently, the foundation distributed $8,500 to over 17 students. Today, I would like to introduce to you a young lady, Miss Lisa Beeson. She is an early participant of the scholarship program having received three scholarships, is now a member of the Board of Directors of the Foundation, and who is forever grateful to its chairman, Alan Shepard. Lisa. Admiral Alan B. Shepard, Jr. Some of you knew him simply as Al Shepard. When I was putting together my thoughts for today, I was somewhat uncertain how I wanted to refer to Alan Shepard because he was simultaneously one of the greatest heroes in American history and also one of the most approachable and friendly people I have known. I'm here to pay tribute to Alan Shepard today because of the tremendous impact that he had on my life and on the lives of the other 105 people who have, so far, received the Astronaut Scholarship. Everyone knows about Alan's incredible accomplishments as the first American to fly in space, his walk on the moon, and the other public achievements throughout his career in the space program and in the Navy. However, since 1984, Alan worked on something which was not as widely known, but which I think will prove to be his greatest legacy. That is the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. Even among people who have achieved great goals, Alan stands out because he continued to contribute to the greatness of America up through the last days of his life. It was his dedication to the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation which made it into the solid organization that it is today. He helped it grow from its beginnings of awarding just $7,000 in 1986 to today, we award over $144,000 annually in the form of 17 scholarships that go to some of the top science and engineering students in the nation. He never rested on his past accomplishments. I was always impressed with the amount of time, effort, and caring that he put into the scholarship foundation. He viewed it as his way, along with the other astronauts, 
of continuing to strengthen America's position and capabilities in science and engineering. And it worked. The scholarship winners received not only a monetary award, all of the current recipients and the alumni receive an annual invitation to meet astronauts from the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, and Space Shuttle programs, and to meet each other. It is through these annual meetings that a strong network of scientists and engineers is being formed. Individually and together, they are making advances on many of today's frontiers in science and technology. It is also at these annual meetings where so many of the astronaut scholars have been inspired by Alan Shepard. It was obvious how much he cared about the scholarship winners when he met with them. We were all so thrilled to talk to him, and I love the way he took a genuine interest in the lives of the students and alumni. This group of young scientists and engineers is lucky to have met him. I would not have achieved the success I've experienced today without Alan's de dedication to this scholarship program. The scholarship was the most significant source of funding for my college education. And then after graduation, when I started volunteering with the foundation, it was the support and encouragement of Alan and the other astronauts, which gave me the confidence needed to advance quickly in my career in engineering at Westinghouse. Without that positive feedback, I honestly believe I would not be in the position I am today. It's difficult to describe the impact that he made. Then during the last eight years, as I came to know Alan and serving with him on the board of directors of the Scholarship Foundation for the past couple of years, he always made me feel like I could do anything beyond my wildest dreams. All of the astronaut scholars will be forever grateful to Alan Shepard for everything that he did for us. These simple words can't express the difference he made. Um, to Louise and the entire Shepherd family, I think you have a wonderful guardian angel watching over you now. And I think I've now discovered the answer to the uncertainty that I posed before about what's the best way to refer to Alan Shepherd. I think I'll just call him my friend. Coming up next, according to our schedule, will be NASA Administrator Daniel Golden, who has praised Alan Shepard as one of NASA's greatest pioneers and one of America's shining stars. Louise, Shepard family, and all the friends of Alan Shepard here today. Before I make my personal remarks, I'd like to read you a letter from the President. Dear Mrs. Shepard, Hillary and I were deeply saddened to learn of your husband's death, and our hearts go out to you. Alan Shepard was a true hero, with courage, determination, and an irrepressible sense of humor. He blazed a trail for our nation into the unknown and sparked the dreams of a generation. As the first American in space and one of, the on one of only 12 to walk on the moon, he made an enormous contributions to our space program and expanded the reach of human knowledge. I hope you will take comfort in knowing that your husband holds a special place not only in our nation's history, but also in the hearts of his fellow Americans. His death is a great loss for us all. We are keeping you and your family in our thoughts and prayers. Sincerely, Bill Clinton. I know it can be done, that it's important for it to be done, and I want to do it. These simple but poignant words were written in Life magazine in 1959. The author captured NASA's mind, body, and soul. The author was NASA's mind, body, and soul, Alan Shepard. Alan dared to dream. He believed in his heart that the NASA family had the talent, courage, and focus to do what others said we in America couldn't do. And he wanted to be first. He, like the other astronauts of Mercury 7, wanted to lead the way. 
but not just in the early days. Everyone knows about Alan Shepard's historic ride on Freedom 7 and his golf shot during Apollo 14. But he did so much more. He was a fighter who always fought for our nation and its space program. He always fought for the future. I remember one instance in 1993 when the space program was in big trouble in the Congress. Alan, always a competitor, went to work. He wrote editorials and made phone calls on the upcoming vote on the nation's space program. John Glenn can tell you that members of Congress get a lot of phone calls from a lot of important people. But when Alan Shepard was on the line, you always picked up the phone. Many people predicted a resounding loss, and many people predicted an end to space exploration for decades to come. America won its space program by a single vote that year. Ever since, the margin of victory has increased, and ever since, the space program has gotten stronger. We win in large part because Alan Shepard knew it could be done, that it was important that it be done, and he wanted to do it. Alan was not only a fighter, but a visionary. Alan told me on many occasions about his vision for Mars exploration. His eyes would light up. No surprise, he personally wanted to go, and he wanted to be first. I could tell you today, Alan, America will go to Mars. And when we do it, it will be because we, like you, knew it could be done, that it was important that it be done, and that we wanted to do it. That's the way Alan thought. He knew no other way. And now, NASA thinks the same way. Alan Shepard was our mind. Before the Mercury 7 were named, not too many people really knew about our space program in America or the world. NASA was around, but we're really a bunch of nerdy engineers and scientists. Talented and hard-working nerds, nonetheless. But then Alan Shepard and the Mercury 7 came along. They were intense, determined, and willing to risk their lives to open the space frontier for our country. They gave America's space program a real face. And they gave our nation what all nations and what all people need Heroes, genuine, bona fide heroes. The Mercury 7 were the beginning, and Al was the first. At a time when our nation's confidence was down, he had the courage to climb on top that not completely tested Redstone missile and open the space frontier. He was our mind and our body. That first trip to space lasted only 15 minutes, but the space Alan Shepard occupies in our history, in our nation's consciousness, in our hearts, will last forever. After all, it's a very high compliment when someone wants to grow up to be like you. Literally millions of children wanted to grow up like Alan Shepard. Older kids like me still do. Because when he lifted off, he lifted our spirits, and he inspired us to always explore the unknown and discover what's possible, to always think of the future, to always do our part. Alan was our soul. The poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow once wrote, were a star quenched on high, for ages would its light, still traveling downward from the sky, shine on our mortal sight. So when a great man dies for years behind his ken, the light he leaves behind him lies upon the paths of men. 
Alan Shepard lived to travel toward stars quenched on high. Today, he is a star quenched on high, and his spirit shines on. It shines on Louise and his family. It shines on America. And it shines on a space program that, whether the moon, Mars, or beyond, promises to live by the words, I know it can be done, that it's important for it to be done, and I want to do it. Alan Shepard, a brilliant star in the heavens, will forever shine on us, NASA's mind, body, and soul. A moving tribute by the head of NASA, Daniel Golden, at this ceremony in Houston, Texas, at the Johnson Space Center for Alan Shepard. We'll be back right after this. Sunday. America wins the space race. Moonshot, CNN Perspectives, Sunday. This is CNN. And all my at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, for today's moving and stirring tribute to Alan Shepard, who died last month at the age of 74. Jeffrey Kluger has been watching this with me in New York. He is with Time Magazine, the co-author of Apollo 13. Jeffrey, my impression is that it's difficult to overstate what Alan Shepard accomplished for this country's space program. I mean, we heard Daniel Golden a moment ago talking about that Redstone rocket not having been completely tested when it carried Shepard aloft. Well, that's right. Uh, America's rockets in those days had an unfortunate tendency to blow up long before they ever got where they were going, and the Redstones and the atlases that followed them certainly uh, fit that profile. Um, not only that, the spacecraft he was flying in, the Mercury spacecraft on top of the booster, was really more of a garment than a vehicle. It was infinitesimally small. It certainly was the, the, provided the slimmest protection between the astronaut and the environment of space, and yet he was willing to climb aboard and take it where it took him. Now, as the colors are being moved out at the Johnson Space Center, Jeffrey, talk to me a, a bit, if you will, about Alan Shepard's personality. I think technical expertise aside, each astronaut lends a certain personality to the space program. What was his mark? Well, Shepard, like the other six original astronauts, was certainly something of a swashbuckler. I think that's how he got the job in the first place. Uh, but he was also known for having two personalities. He was, as Tom Wolfe called him, either Smiling Al or the Icy Commander. And the people who worked with him knew you would get either, either one on any given day, the stern Al or the gregarious Al. Let's listen to a bit of the Navy hymn. Heartfelt emotion today at the Johnson Space Center at this memorial for Alan Shepard. I'm Gene Randall in Washington. Thank you to Jeffrey Kluger in New York. We'll be back in a moment with the hour's top news. Godspeed, Alan Shepard.
your business today? What if you did? How can Bank of America help you succeed? Bank of America, put your future in motion. The best show on television is coming to TNT five nights a week. Race 240 and climbing. No pulse. This isn't working. Are you seizing? Somebody help her! Whoa, wait a minute. See how it all began with the two-hour movie that started it all. Shut up and don't mark! ER, five nights a week. We're still living in dark. Coming Sunday, September 6th at 8 Eastern on TNT. You've heard one side. Oppose any phone. You've heard the other. Now hear the whole story. The epic documentary series, Cold War, coming in September to CNN. You'd expect breaking news from CNN Interactive, but how about fashion, travel, showbiz, health and medical news, science breakthroughs, weather, plus links to CNN's great business and sports sites. No wonder it's called the Godzilla of websites. CNN Interactive, a whole world of news and information on the World Wide Web. Get it all at CNN.com. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. At Crossfire, we know our left from our right. Lively debate with Bill Press and Pat Buchanan. Weeknights, 7.30 Eastern on CNN. Sunday on CNN Perspectives. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. America wins the space race, as told by Alan Shepard and Deke Slayton. Moonshot, CNN Perspectives, Sunday. An emotional farewell to American space hero Alan Shepard wrapped up a short time ago in Houston. Space pioneers and others paid tribute to America's first space traveler back in 1961. The memorial service was at the Johnson Space Center. Al's legacy as a pioneer in our space program is firmly etched in the history books. He was fiercely competitive and won the position to be the first American in space. He had the motivation and the perseverance to hang in there during eight years of being grounded before he finally flew on Apollo 14 and landed on the moon in a place called Frau Morrow. When that opportunity was earlier denied me, I cannot think of a more appropriate person to take my place than Alan B. Shepard. Well, we had lots of, lots of good flying, lots of good times together, lots of good tests, and a lot of things going on. Now you're up there in that big hangar in the sky having a lot of good flights, and we'll miss you, Al. But we'll be there for long, so we'll try some of that flying ourselves. America has lost one of its true adventures, someone whose entire life was dictated by the American questing spirit. And Alan and, and Scott and Gordo and Wally and I have lost more than a friend. We've lost another brother. Alan Shepard died July 22nd after a long battle with leukemia. He was 74. United States and for that we go to senior meteorologist Valerie Voss. Val? Well, Lori, the heat is the big story. We finished one month, July, started August, and uh, several cities across Texas, including Shreveport, San Antonio, Austin, Del Rio, have reported their hottest July ever. Record-breaking heat yesterday, Friday, across uh, eastern Texas, from Dallas to Longview, Lufkin, down to Houston. Dallas at 106 again today. That's day 27 in a row. The record set back in 1980 is 42. And... It doesn't right now look as though they're going to make it. Uh, Saturday, 106, that's today's temperature, and we've, I've been looking at some of the models. Thank you. Astronaut Alan Shepard received a final Godspeed from his many friends today, most notably from four guys who, like him, had just the right stuff to put the U.S. ahead in space at the critical time. CNN's Paul Karen reports on a moving tribute to the first American in space. Father. 
past and present NASA astronauts said goodbye to one of their own, the first American in space, Alan Shepard. America has lost one of its true adventurers, someone whose entire life was dictated by the American questing spirit. And Alan and, and Scott and Gordo and Wally and I have lost more than a friend. We've lost another brother. The astronauts recalled how, as rivals, they survived the massive endurance test and training required for the rigors of space travel together and became as close as brothers. My hat's off to you, Bartlett. Thank you for all you have done for the Navy, for the space program, and for your country. It is an honor and a privilege to have known you. Shepard was one of only 12 humans to walk on the moon. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell walked on the moon with Shepard during the Apollo 14 mission. I am uh, privileged that Alan Joe Stewart and I had to go with him. He was a wonderful teammate, colleague, leader, and boss. Shepard was named one of the original Mercury astronauts in 1959. He carried American dreams and the country's banner into space for the first time on a historic 15-minute mission on May 5, 1961. We raced many miles in identical Corvettes. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Al, that I never told you that I changed the ratio in my differential. <laughs> and you really weren't any less a driver. It's just that I cheated a little on you. The man who took a country into the space age, his colleagues say, was really one for all ages. Paul Karen, CNN. You're going to get the big promotion and the transfer to Iowa that goes with it. Great. And that get-rich-quick scheme that Howard wants you to invest in, it works for Howard. Wouldn't it be great That's if you could Howard. talk to an older... A defining moment in the history of man. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Man walks on the moon for the very first time and America wins the space race. When Cooper and John Glenn were on hand, Shepard was the first American in space and died last month. And that is our news. Now back to Jack and Jody. All right, Susan, thanks very much. And Joe Witte has now claimed its 99th victim, the death of a 45-year-old man in Austin, Texas. It has been so hot in Texas that construction crews are now working at night to escape the triple-digit temperatures. It's only slightly cooler at night. And for the really bad news, the forecast looks like no end in sight. Temperatures in August appear to be running, or that they will run even higher than July. And July in Texas average, the average, was 102 degrees. Several hundred mourners gathered yesterday at the Johnson Space Center in Houston to remember the astronaut Alan Shepard. Shepard died last month of leukemia. He was 74. The four surviving members of the Mercury Space Program paid a tearful tribute to the man who helped pave the way for Americans in space. Here's ABC's Valerie Williams. And I shall hear the it was a gathering of the old timers, the men who have their own space records, the brave pioneers, who came to say an emotional farewell to Alan Shepard. I'll make it by my hat. Shepard was the first of the firsts, in 1961, strapped aboard a Mercury Redstone rocket Shepard became the first American to soar into space. His flight lasted a mere 15 minutes, but what dreams he ignited. Literally millions of children wanted to grow up like Alan Shepard. All the kids like me still do. Shepard later became one of only 12 men to walk on the moon. Again, he made history by driving golf balls from the lunar surface. Now you're up there in that big hangar in the sky and a lot of good flights. And we'll miss you, Al. But we'll be there for long, so we'll try some of that flying ourselves. As a nation, we tend to remember those heroic first astronauts as they stood on the edge of their dreams. 
but as they enter their twilight years, those dreams have become memories. Al Shepard was their leader. Valerie Williams, ABC News, Houston. One other quick note here. Organizers are calling it the largest ever bike about that. More than 700 riders pedaled into Washington yesterday, completing a cross-country ride, the purpose of which was to... Production at the Huffy assembly line in Salina, Ohio, has come to the end of the road. The last Huffy bicycle at the plant was made yesterday leaving 650 union employees without jobs. Now the company will produce bikes at its non-union plant in Farmington, Missouri, and import bicycles from Asia and Mexico. Employees were sentimental as the last red 20-inch voice bike came off the line. Today I had the uh, dubious honor of uh, packing out the... <coughs> excuse me. The last steel workers bicycle out of the plant it's a very hard day for, for me and for everybody here. Gonna miss y'all. The plant was the biggest employer in the county. A legal win for Federal Express. An appeals court has ruled the U.S. Postal Service cannot claim a federal agency's protection against lawsuits. The ruling stems from a suit filed by FedEx claiming it was damaged by a critical ad campaign launched by the Postal Service. In 1970, Congress dissolved the Post Office Department, replacing it with the Postal Service, allowing it to operate more like a private business while remaining a federal agency. Not much of a lead-in for the weather, but here is Valerie Voss, Val. No, but those Huffy bikes, I remember. That's how I learned to ride a bike on one of those 20-inch Huffies. More Texas heat in the eastern part of the country, not the kind of weather for bike riding or anything else. Dallas, Texas, 106. Yesterday, a record high. That makes it day 26, and today will be day 27, because the heat will go on. Our weather watch showing you that heat advisories have been issued not only through Texas, from Austin up to Dallas, but over into southern Arkansas and much of Louisiana as well. Highs today up to the triple digits, but a lot of the rest of the country is enjoying a day that looks suspiciously like a preview of fall, even though we're far from the start of fall. Temperatures will change a bit in some parts of the country over the next 24 hours. A little warmer through the northeast, a little cooler as some rain moves into the northern plains. Not much change with the heat in Texas, although the southeast is a little cooler today, and they'll stay that way tomorrow. It is warming up again across sections of the Intermountain West. We're going to see some 90s in that area. Plenty of triple digits down through the south, and 70s and 80s, pretty much the story across a lot of the rest of the country. Here's our forecast weather map later today. All of the rain will be concentrated along this frontal boundary. There's a severe thunderstorm watch in effect for sections of Montana, Wyoming, over into Nebraska. And that's just where severe storms are possible today down across this region. If you look at our rainfall accumulation, heavy rains associated with that, especially when we get into Kansas and Missouri, some showers and storms through the southwest. There's some flood watches in effect in Arizona. They have been in effect in New Mexico. And thunderstorms through the southeast once again will produce some heavy downpours in that region. There is a flash flood watch in effect up across western sections of Washington state. We've seen some pretty heavy rains across that region. This is the rain that will be moving eastward with time. And we're also going to see some of the flash flooding that I mentioned, Arizona and New Mexico. Of course, the ground here doesn't uh, absorb a lot of moisture very well, so any kind of a heavy downpour or runs off and causes some flooding, especially in canyons and arroyos. Um, I'm going to show you some forecasts now for the next few days. has had a lot of interest in this first Atlantic tropical storm of the season, and we've been watching it carefully. This is Alex, moving west-northwestward, just hanging on to tropical storm intensity. Uh, given the direction it's headed right now, it looks like it's going to miss most of the, most of the lesser and even the greater Antilles, uh, but we will bear, keep watching it. There are another couple of waves behind it that will bear watching as well. Out in the Pacific, Hurricane Estelle is a big, well-developed hurricane. 
but not threatening any land areas at all. Gene? Thank you, Val. They may not make perfect pets, but chimpanzees are being sold on the black market, and that threatens their survival. Sharon Collins looks at how a British couple is trying to save the chimps. <laughs> Every year, the mammal closest to man edges one step closer to extinction. <laughs> Despite an international treaty banning their trade, endangered chimps are still smuggled out of Africa. They're sold as pets or used as tourist attractions in Europe and other places. Jim and Alison Cronin, who run an ape sanctuary in Dorset, England, received a tip recently about monkeys on the market in Turkey. The couple shot this video as evidence. And how much does she want them? 10,000 US. Posing as potential buyers, the couple found five chimps, most of them in poor condition. Those babies are sitting in markets in the heat of the summer. They're dehydrating, they're suffering abuse, they're being beaten, and they're dying. And there's no need. The trade has to be stopped because the chimpanzee in West Africa is being wiped out. One of the chimps, a baby female, was found cowering in a cage. It had been fed the wrong food and was unlikely to live. Another, a male, had cigarette burns on its head. Punishment for misbehaving. Hello, sweetie. The Turkish government, which has signed a treaty banning the trade of endangered species, has not yet seized the chimps, but they're considering it. And the Cronins, who have worked with other European countries to provide a home for confiscated apes, say they're willing to do the same for Turkey. We will assist any government to rescue and rehabilitate any great ape. We will give them a home in Dorset. We will, at this point, meet with the Turkish authorities. Let us rescue the babies that are starving and dying from this sort of trade in Istanbul. Let us bring them back to England. Sharon Collins, CNN. Today's world depends on complex information systems, our electronic infrastructure and it's increasingly vulnerable to attack. But Washington is restricting the encryption technology that...